good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. It's a pleasure to be here. And today I'll be talking about PostScript uh, and the security related stuff about PostScript. So, just a very short who am I? Uh, I'm was involved in my fair classic uh, universal toolkit writing for recovering RFID uh, keys from my fair classic cards. And uh, more recently, I've been uh, doing some uh, printer and MFP hacking for the last two years, I think. And basically, the postscript is a continuation of the research I've been doing. And in general, I'm uh, interested in holistic security, uh, like in general approach. So. You have some of my papers, presentations, and uh, advisories. I'm a PhD student with Eurecom. Uh, yeah, so that's short about me. Uh, this is the agenda we'll be following today. Uh, but before we proceed, I would like to do a uh, short uh, communication with you. Like, how many of you? Uh, deal with uh, PostScript, let's say, uh, pr uh, printer drivers, uh, have you installed usually, does it give you headaches? Oh, okay, 10%. Any of you have written any PostScript uh, program by hand? Okay, three people. Okay, that's good. Okay, so uh, it's just for me. I, when I go to conferences, I just want to, to know how many people just code PostScript. Uh, a quick refresher, which uh, it's uh, very helpful because it, uh, I, I am surprised and uh, to see that even over years and years, uh, there's professionals who are not uh, uh, basically are not aware of the abuse potential carried by the printers and MFPs. And uh, this is a small diagram which shows uh, the, the potential abuse because printers are part of your internal network. It's that gray box at the end of the corridor which nobody knows where it is usually or doesn't care about it. But uh, from another perspective or from security perspective, first of all, it's part of your internal network, as you can see. Uh, and it's uh, a trusted resource, right? Uh, because it's part of your internal network, you configure it with uh, username, password for your LDAP, SNMP, and so on and so on. Uh, it prints confidential information because confidential information sometimes gets printed. Uh, it doesn't have like a lot of uh, patch uh, management or is not very uh, streamlined patch management or uh, vulnerability management. And uh, even in most of the cases or in some cases, uh, it is publicly accessible through the internet because of uh, convenience uh, and because of misconfiguration and the general idea oh, is just a printer. So there will be no problems just connecting it to the internet, right? Uh, the history of hacking uh, MFPs and the printers goes back to the 60s when there was a story about Xerox uh, putting mechanical and electromechanical uh, a video camera in a Xerox machine in the Soviet uh, Union embassy. So it's not something new, but nowadays it's not electromechanical. Nowadays it's more digital, but the concept is the same. So you bug the, the machine from inside and you get the confidential information. Um, so from the dig digital point of view, uh, the research goes like from 2002 and it kept uh, uh, occurring every four years, uh, some kind of a pattern. So recently there was uh, a more interest spawn because uh, more interest was uh, raised for embedded devices and uh, printers fall into some kind of embedded devices. So from 2010 to 2012, uh, there were like three or four different directions on researching security of printers. And basically starting to, from 2010, uh, I've, when I've been doing research, it's like it's a small uh, screenshot, but you can see the video online afterwards. Uh, basically, on the internet, it's like you can see, I've just quickly mapped, it's like less than half a day of work, just quickly map more than 20,000 uh, 20, printers connected publicly to the internet. And those are like not the, you know, inkjet ones which you use at home to print your photos. These are like enterprise level, like they have everything, uh, fax, uh, they have uh, scans, all, all in one, one piece. So, 
basically, the, all over the world, you see a lot of these connected directly to the internet. Just go and hug them. And it's scary when you see the picture and the video. It's a little bit scary. Uh, then uh, there's other things where, where, where for example, some legacy uh, um, uh, piece of uh, software has the uh, ability to, to interact with the printer. And uh, I've been demonstrating uh, a Word document having non-malicious uh, data for the PC, but it has a malicious stream for the printer. So once it gets printed, the, it uploads a file or changes the screen on the printer. So basically, there's uh, various avenues where you can uh, send malicious streams, and your PC uh, antivirus or IDS, IPS will not even trigger because there is no IDS, IPS, or antivirus solution for the printers. And I'm telling this for the last two years. I'm, I'm not pushing for a solution, but there is nothing which actually tries to, to detect the malicious streams for the printers. Uh, and basically, uh, the printing can also be done and initiated from the, from the internet, from the site. So basically, if you send a link, a malicious phishing link, uh, the victim can fall into to the link, and there's JavaScript and Java. So basically, both of these can initiate and uh, send uh, directly to the printer of the user uh, mal um, attacker control and malicious stream. So basically, you have full control. Basically, if you send control sequence uh, to, to the printer, you get uh, pretty much everything from the victim's printer. So again, uh, if a site uh, prompts you to print a free ticket or a, a free something, uh, I would uh, think twice before printing. Just a general advice. I'm not saying everything is malicious, but the, the idea is, is there. I mean, think, think twice before printing, is because it's not just only paper. It's uh, the, the embedded device in your printer. Uh, OK, so that was like a very quick re refresher re uh, about uh, MFEs and printers. If you are more interested, uh, you can check the, the previous papers. But now I, I, I want to, to go further with PostScript because it's a very interesting topic in itself. So um, a little bit about PostScript. It's, a, it's a, let's say, a technology which was introduced in 85 by Adobe. And it's uh, being used uh, as a, one of the main technologies uh, in the printer's uh, world. Uh, basically, it's, uh, you know, there are two kind of uh, printer drivers, PostScript drivers and PCL drivers. And uh, PostScript is like covering 60% of the share uh, in terms of technology. And the idea is that it's, uh, it's one of the first languages which was there for formatting the, the data for the printers. Now, uh, as you can see, the, the, the picture is taken from, the, from Adobe, and it's very, very, very uh, representative because the road is bumpy and it has unexpected turns. I mean, it was like very, very interesting uh, picture if you see the, the original. So, in itself, uh, PostScript is not just carrier for your uh, printer data or for the characters which end up uh, on on the paper. PostScript is actually a programming language. So. Given, uh, given it's a programming language, and it's, uh, I'll come back uh, later, so you understand you can do much more than just printing data. You can actually run some computation on the printer or what, whatever the PostScript is being rendered, be it on your computer or maybe rendered on the printer. So there have been uh, numerous examples of, uh, okay, graphics and patterns is like the, the, the initial goal of PostScript, but then it got expanded to very complex math. It has very powerful matrix computation for doing the graphics. So there were people writing web servers, uh, XML parsers, uh, ray tracing, basically doing really cool stuff in 3D in PostScript. And some people even control their milling machines, like they connect the laser printer because it has a step motor, and it con con uh, controls very, very precise the milling machine. So um, what exactly is PostScript? It's like a very, very interesting technology. And the idea is, is as I said, it's not just a text or a static image which goes to your computer, uh, to, to your printer. It's a programming language. And basically, I'll just enumerate. It's a dynamically typed and concatenative stack-based Turing complete programming language. So maybe you, you ask yourself, what the hell is this, right? Because all these seem very out of space. Uh, so I'll show you example by example, and the, I'll just stop now for the Turing completeness. Is, uh, the idea is that if you have a general computation, let's say uh, password cracking or uh, rainbow table computation, 
It's a general computation, right? You can take this uh, computation from any language, be it Python, C, whatever, and through the Turing complete transform, you can uh, make it in a postscript. So basically, you can have a very distributed, large scale, uh, general purpose computation platform. So you can use printers for this purpose as well. Just have everything transformed uh, to postscript. Uh, and uh, yeah. Basically, what happens uh, when uh, the user prints uh, uh, a document or hits print button is like uh, what happens in, in the background is whatever what you see on, on the editor gets sent in a specific format for, for your platform to the printer driver. Uh, for Windows, it's uh, some uh, Windows internal. For Linux, it's different. Uh, so it gets sent to, to the printer driver. The printer driver understands that format, and then it transforms to, uh, the, the data to the PostScript, which is the language which the printer understands. And then it just sends uh, the, the PostScript data over the wire okay, to the printer. Uh, however, for example, you can also uh, see PostScript documents on the, on the computer. Basically, I, most of you have uh, used or heard about GhostScript, which is the viewer for the servers or for the PCs to view PostScript documents, because sometimes you just receive a, an academic or journal paper in PostScript format, and you just open it to, to read it. So uh, and in that case, it just gets rendered and executed on your, your machine in the sandboxed environment, because uh, PostScript is like, uh, you can think of it as a Java sandbox. Uh, it's a high-level uh, programming language running in a sandbox environment, pretty much like Java. Uh, so basically, you can exploit uh, the, the sandbox, if by saving the sandbox or doing some other inter interesting stuff. I mean, it's not directly comparable to Java, but the parallel is quite there. Sandbox, uh, environment, very high level uh, programming language. So again, uh, the very important thing is that the, a program is, is not static data. A program can make decisions. It can do the basic if, else, whatever not, right? Uh, so I'll just start with uh, a small uh, demo. It's like the simplest thing of denial of service is just do an infinite loop, right? So basically, PostScript being a programming language, you can craft the simplest document which looks like this, like what, 10 characters, less than 10 characters, and it will basically, on some printers, it, you'll have to reset printers or just hit the reset, uh, cancel button. For, uh, for, for some uh, software-based, you'll just hang the, the software. And the software is just, you have to kill it. There's no other way you can end it. So I'll just show you how it's uh, done, for example, in MS Office. Because my, you might not know, but uh, I'll show later. PostScript is like uh, in many more products than you actually manage because you have those renderers very deep in the product. But you are not aware because you just see the picture or the rendered final product. But the, Interpreter is still there. So Office has like an interpreter for uh, PostScript. And for example, if I try to insert a picture, OK. <coughs> so you see it's like uh, EPS. EPS is basically an in haste PostScript. It's uh, usually. Uh, uh, for representing images, but at the end of the day, it's the same PostScript. Why well, it's called in haste? Because normally it has, like, for the software or printers which do not support uh, the PostScript interpreter, it has a binary, uh, a binary um, uh, thumbnail kind of thing, which goes like something like this, whatever. It's in the header, right? And it goes like this. Uh, so for the, uh, for the pieces of software which uh, Support the interpreter, it interprets for the uh, pieces of software which, which do not support a PostScript. It will just take the bitmap, thumbnail, and display. OK, so we have this, uh, this simplest DOS, and uh, we'll just load it. And as you can see, it just hangs. Because it's, it tries to read the file, right? It tries to execute in the office interpreter and it gets stuck. And surprisingly not, you just cannot cancel. It's like you have to kill it. And I mean, it's 
the, 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 there's basically no bug. I mean, the bug is in user interface, but there's no bug because PostScript is like a programming language. It's supposed to do the loops. I mean, but the idea of incorporating like a PostScript interpreter in a piece of software, have, uh, which is a programming language, is needs some more design or some more thought security-wise, right? I mean, you'd be surprised to find a Java interpreter in your uh, MS Office as well, right? I mean, you can do a lot of stuff, but... Okay, we'll kill it. Now, uh, when uh, on the previous slide, when I said it's dynamically typed and concatenative, what it uh, actually means is that uh, you can actually concatenate strings or uh, statements, okay? You can concatenate uh, string and st or statements. You can convert them to be executable or not. And basically, you can say now it's a string, but then it's an executable piece. So you concatenate and dynamically type. So you can construct a, prog a, a program like on the fly, right? And the idea is that you cannot statically analyze a PostScript stream. Just because of this, because you can dynamically generate the program on the fly. So the, your static analysis will not work. And your IDS and IPS rules will not work because in order to understand what the program does, you have to interpret it in, a, in an environment. And I'll, I'll just show a, a simple example. Where, for example, you have Okay, so we have like two functions, uh, concatenate string or merge string, they are both equivalent, as you can see. Uh, and this is our original loop, right, which gets a denial of service on software or on printers. This is the loop. But, uh, and it is commented, it's not active, it's here for the pur demonstration purpose. Now, these, these ones are, sorry. These ones, uh, the things you see, are just uh, strings. They're uh, uh, put in, in uh, round parentheses. So this is a string, this is a string, this is a string, and so on and so on. So what happens is, you put, in this case, you see it's the same uh, accolade, accolade, and loop, right? And I put this on, on the stack of the a, of a interpreter, and then I just, as long as there's more than one uh, string on the stack, uh, I just merge. So all these small uh, sequences will, will merge, and it will end up in a string, which looks like this, okay? And then what you do is you do convert to executable. Here comes the dynamically typed thing, so you can make it convert executable. I mean, it's not executable in the sense that it's uh, executable for Microsoft Windows, but it's a executable code in terms of PostScript interpreter. So you convert it to executable and just fire exec. So I mean, and you can see that uh, this one is the simplest form of uh, creating the infinite loop. I mean, you can go any encoding you like, uh, then uh, obfuscate the code, and you'll never understand what happens because the code is dynamically generated through multitude, basically infinite uh, number of paths you can generate it. You can have a generator, and it will generate languages uh, or a final statement in any way random possible, so, and just execute it. So just for demonstration, I'll, I'll do very quick. Okay, so it's the same thing, uh, but is EPS format. Okay, it's just a little bit different header. So I'll just open. Oops. No. So the side effect is the same. I mean, it demonstrates the concatenative uh, nature and the dynamically typed nature of the PostScript. And that's why, again, the bad news is that your IDS and IPS and antivirus will not work because it's not static, it cannot have any signature. Just fire a generator engine, you are done. Now, as part of my academic exercise, I'm uh, working on a sandbox environment which 
would take a postscript and uh, in a sandbox environment get a trace of it, uh, see if it's malicious or not. Now, uh, another thing is that, for example, being a programming language is, I mean, how many of you, I, I think at least once everybody who wrote a C program, a backtrack, had a recursive and stack crash because it never ended, right? So, because it's a programming language, so you can, you can actually do the same in uh, PostScript, where you can take a program and uh, you basically crash the interpreter because it, you, you never end the recursion. So, you have a, a, a function A and you, you call it recursively. As you can see, A calls A inside it. So, it's like a recursive function. And if you, if you for example, open or run this uh, sample on various interpreters, like be it GoScript or MS Office or uh, some other, let's say, even printers, like some of the interpreters being wrongly implemented, they'll crash. And just small example. The bad news for, for, this uh, for this example is that it's not directly exploitable in terms of e by, uh, bypassing from PostScript interpreter to the stack of the MS Office, but you get the general idea. I mean, the, the fact it crashes, I mean, you can try to, to, to find other ways to, to, to get out of the sandbox. So basically, it just run and crash. It's 100%. Like, it crashes all the time. And there's other ways to, to exit the, the sandbox, basically, and uh, get to the uh, memory space of a program which uh, in incorporates the interpreter. Okay, now uh, for, from our perspective, there are like uh, other programs like GoScript or some other implementation which have various custom extensions because they have like a standard PostScript implementation and then they, because uh, they need more uh, like flexibility over time, they add some custom extensions. So basically, in, under certain conditions, for example, if you receive a file, usually to, to print it, right, you would have to read and then print uh, if you are sure. But in this case, for example, you just open, OK. Uh, and once I click OK, I'm not sure if in the back it will be seen, but here, uh, you know where the, the printing icon appears it will appear a printing icon directly, just opening. Directly, it opens a, a connection to your printer, and basically you can, uh, to a certain degree, you can control the stream. It's still some, some, some specifics, uh, not 100% reliable, but you get the idea. Just opening the, the file for, because of some uh, custom uh, extensions, just directly prints, and that malicious print stream can go directly to your printer, and your printer is owned, as you can, uh, will see in the second part of this talk. Okay, so again, uh, functionality sometimes compromises security, because once opening a file, you don't expect it to automatically print, unless you have done some auto settings, but I'm not sure how many do, do this. Okay, now the, the, the thing which I like uh, a lot is about PostScript being a programming language is that it can actually do statements, right? I mean, it can do if, else, and so on. So basically, when, uh, when you open a file, it can detect the environment where it runs, whether it runs on a printer, whether it runs on a Ghost script uh, software, or so on. So basically, this example shows you, as you can see, it uh, uses the product operator, and the product operator returns on the stack uh, the product, I mean, the environment where it runs. And for the Go script, it's a, a string which says GPL Go, Go script, right? So basically, what the, the, the PostScript can do is like you have a PostScript file having a malicious payload, which I'll show in the second part, has a malicious payload. And it executes, for example, only on a printer X but it fails on, uh, on a user PC because it's not a printer. So you want the user to print the file directly on the printer. What, what uh, the social engineering part is, you display like, uh, if you detect that your environment is computer-based, 
as, as you can see, here is an if-else, right? So the first part is the if. If it's GPL Go script, then it displays the image. And the image can be a social engineer part, which says the printer driver encounters unexpected error. Please print this document directly using the printer interface. So basically, you can social engineer the user by putting some fake uh, image. So the user will take the file. OK, if the operating system or the printer driver says print directly to the printer, just go to the interface of the printer and, and dump. And in the else branch, the malicious stuff goes here, which means that you put the malicious stuff for the printer. And when the user goes and prints the, the file on the printer, it gets executed on the printer. And another part is, for example, again, it's dynamical. So you send, a, let's say, a PostScript kind of document to, to, to a guy. And usually what, what happens is the user flow is like this. You open a contract or a document, you read it, and when you print, you expect it to be the same thing, right? I mean, you, how many of you printed like 100-page contract and go again, after reading it on the screen, go again and read it from the paper? Nobody did, right? You just read on the screen, print, sign, stamp. So basically, because it's like dynamically typed, you can have a situation where you send like an invoice or a contract where it says, OK, pay 100 euro. The user sees the terms right. He clicks print on the printer. There is like an if else and say, OK, let's put it 1,000. Why not? The user will not go to page 128 from 1,000 pages and read the exact number. And he'll just sign. What is signed is signed, right? So again, it's like. A good example, I mean, I know technical stuff doesn't get through very well, but this kind of business stuff gets very well through. So, I mean, uh, of course, it's not very common that business people exchange documents in PostScript format, but you get the general idea. So, and you'd be surprised that basically when I started uh, finding these PostScript uh, pieces and bits, uh, where it runs, I actually started from printers, but then Surface seems to be a little bit wider. So basically, I try to do a, some kind of chart and categories. At the bottom is the, is the Adobe's PostScript interpreter specification. And based on this, uh, there are imp implementation of the PostScript standard, which uh, the result of which is a PostScript interpreter, which uh, most of uh, software base is uh, GhostScript. Uh, in the MS Office Access Softec, Adobe has its own interpreter because yeah, they did the standard, they did their own interpreter. And on printer is like a very, I call them various artists because there's a lot of uh, smaller companies which do the embedded versions of the interpreter. And on top, you can see the actual end, uh, end result applications which use various uh, interpreters inside them or they are based on a specific interpreters. So you can see the CAPS or GIMP or LaTeX, they're based on GhostScript because they run on PC, MS Office, which is based on Access Softec, and so on and so on. OK, so another uh, perspective of seeing where, where the affected software is, uh, is, for example, you have a network, and I try to make a category where potentially you can find these pieces of to software. So basically, on the client machines, you can find this part of GhostScript packages, Office, or Adobe products, not all of them. Uh, on the network side, the, on the printers, you, you have the various artists. And also, sometimes you have a print server, which is if a, a dedicated machine or a small box, which just does the relay of the print jobs. And you have CAPS running on them or some, some uh, embedded interpreter sometimes. OK, so that's a small uh, taxonomy. And OK, because everything is now web, to, to zero web related. It's uh, very interesting to find that there's, uh, uh, there are a lot of services on the internet, which I cannot name because more details have to come. Uh, but I mean, if you do your homework, it's like you find them. Uh, they run PostScript as part of their products or as part of their processing stream. So basically, I found around 20 services uh, which run the PostScript, uh, and uh, even Google was running it, and uh, 
they had a vulnerable version and they uh, got, uh, got uh, bounty rewards for this. Uh, but the findings is that, uh, for example, most of them were running uh, vulnerable versions of Go script as part of their chain of processing, which is bad. I mean, bad in the sense that Go script, uh, if you go and, uh, and check the exploit database, you'll see some of the proof of concepts which show uh, stack overflow, exploitation, and so on and so on. So basically, running a vulnerable version of Go script in your network, if as part of your printing subsystem or as part of some software processing, makes vulnerable the, that specific server as well. Uh, some fun findings is that some run Go script as root user. I mean, you have to have guts to run uh, Go script as a root user. Some of them were running without safer settings, right? I mean, these are some, some basic configuration, but these are findings in real, uh, in real uh, web services. So uh, web is not free from PostScript. So I mean, it's not very well, de uh, very wide deployed, but the idea is that it gives a very good insight and, and very unexpected attack vectors for machines, which uh, people do not expect it to be, right? Because it's just, uh, you know, uh, doing some conversion of uh, uh, stream or is uh, doing some printing stuff, which is not quite. So you, once you own that machine or get uh, a lot of information from that machine, you get much more uh, attack surface. Okay, this was the general, uh, the, the general PostScript things. Now I'll move to the second part, which, was, uh, which is more uh, device specific. So as, as, as as part of the, the printer uh, research, yeah, as part of printer research, uh, once we uh, found, I find the way uh, to, to basically embed uh, commands in Word document or in JavaScript or in Java to reach the printer, I got the way to, 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 send, to send something to the printer which I can control. The next logical step is like, now you, you want a payload which does something, right? Once you get your foot in the door, you want the proper payload to send. And the, the, we start, uh, start thinking uh, there were like two easy choices, PCL and PostScript. PCL is just uh, not a programming language. PostScript is a programming language. You can do more. So uh, go, uh, we, I go for, for PostScript. And basically, we start looking for, for products which support PostScript and uh, do firmware analysis, automated, semi-automated ways, sometimes just manually. And the, the, uh, we come, uh, I found the, the documentation, which is good to read documentation. Again, if you're not reading documentation, read it. Read it twice, because it, sometimes it just gives you very precious hints. And for example, if you go to documentation from Xerox, they say it's the page which says, you see, figure four, select the firmware update file and press the green button to send it. And this is uh, on the page where you actually print, right? You see, print immediately. Right, and it says firmware update file will have a file extension of .ps. I mean, doesn't it raise a question when you see a PostScript file which does a firmware update? Of course, it has very, very nice stuff in it. And you go grab it and you go analyze it. So once we, okay, decompile and the, the good part of PostScript, okay, if it's not very well obfuscated because if you do it proper way, it can be obfuscated very well. But usually it comes, you know, free with a source. Everything is like JavaScript in the early days. Everything is with a source. So we start deobfuscating, decompiling uh, the, the uh, PostScript firmware update. And actually we found various uh, APIs, which basically is an extension of Xerox. They have a basic uh, PostScript interpreter. And on top, they have some customization uh, layer which helps them do some management or some uh, uh, additional stuff for, with the device. So they had VxWorks plugs API. So basically, you can uh, communicate with the VxWorks operating system. Uh, they have debug and QA APIs, like generate crash error, generate pump error, and so on, various uh, QA stuff. They had logging. Pump, you could send some uh, pulp, uh, pump uh, parameter for, for ink. Uh, billing meters, uh, RAM disk, RAM and flash. 
And basically, the, there were several uh, directions which were possible to go uh, if a full VX works, but it requires a lot of work, and basically you have to know the exact VX works version and to have the executable and to have the executable to exploit, you have need to have a development environment, which is again very specific. So, uh, what is the simplest thing? If you see, I mean, pick the simplest thing which somebody w from you would choose to go. F hmm? Yeah, RAM. Yeah, RAM. I, okay, RAM disk is yeah good, but RAM. Yeah, you go directly to the RAM. I mean, if you have RAM, you have everything. And actually. Uh, some, uh, some institutes uh, say that 2012 will still, the memory scraping on mobile devices on, or embedded devices will still be in top 10 uh, threads. Memory scraping is the simplest. You get to the memory, you get everything. So, okay, we, we did the memory dumping. It's just a screenshot, but the idea is that you go for the easiest chain. And the memory dumping is, is very powerful. So basically, as part of, of, uh, of memory dumping, basically, we set and had to run a memory dumper in PostScript, which is not quite a, a funny thing to write, but when you end up with good results, you're satisfied that you, run, you, you wrote a PostScript memory dumper. And we, we found that, for example, if you set uh, administrator uh, settings and password on, on the device, uh, and uh, basically, and run audit, you will say the device is secure. It has a password, I mean, a strong password, and the users cannot log to the device and uh, add another user or do some settings. But if you connect to the printing stream port, you have the RAM. So basically, setting a password on the web interface doesn't protect you in any way from the RAM access, uh, from the RAM access attack. So basically, uh, admin restriction fails to prevent memory dumping and other APIs. The second attack, uh, I'll, I'll be showing uh, the demos uh, for, for some others a little bit later. I'll just explain the attacks. So basically, the, uh, other scenarios w which we found is that, for example, the administrator goes and uh, logs in to, to the account to do some management. So basically, the attacker can go to the, and they do this with get request. This is important, because in the get request, everything is in the URL, in clear text. And the idea is that uh, in memory, we have the web server uh, logging uh, section. And basically, you go, you dump the memory from the proper location. And because it's a get request, the URL, including the passwords, is everything in the clear text in the memory. If they would have done this as a HTTP POST request, it would have been tougher, but it's a very interesting point that things, small things like this that, oh, it doesn't matter, it's a GET or a POST, right? But it matters at the end of the day because uh, with GET, you have the URL being logged and uh, the attacker extracts the, the password. Uh, the second is like a continuation of the attack is after the user, uh, this is also for the password change. Basically, when the, the admin changed the password, you, you can see the parameters being changed in the URL. This one is when the administrator logs in. Basically, all the headers, HTTP headers, are there. So again, in the memory, you can find the base64 encoded basic aut authentication strings. So again, with some uh, small pattern uh, recognition and memory dumping, you get the, the most, the latest uh, password being used to log into the web interface. So the device is again compromised. And basically, you, the, the solution which people uh, try to, to, to say is okay, put SSL. SSL is secure, never mind the expired certificate or uh, self signed certificate, just close their eyes. It's fine. I mean, it still works, it's, it's good. But the problem is, what to do when your private key is being leaked in, in memory. I mean, this is also a part which has to be properly analyzed when it's not only for the printers, but I mean, for all the embedded devices, right? I mean, how many of you, uh, uh, so, or uh, how many of developers, not you, but general developers, uh, after implementing a very secure solution, go and scrap their memory to see whether they are leaking stuff or not? Not so many, I think. And 
they, they've done this, uh, this as well. They didn't check that actually the, the private key is being in the memory leak. So it basically uh, cancels all the benefits of SSL. And also, there are some default keys which are in, uh, being used in examples, and they reuse it with a copy-paste manner. Okay, uh, the other thing is that when uh, a user uh, sends a document to, to, to the printer to, to send, it can send the classical way, which means uh, plain text and no password. Uh, some people started do, doing some encryption so that the document itself is being encrypted over the wire, so simple Wireshark sniffing would not retrieve the document, which is a good step. But the core idea is that how good the encryption would be on the network, anyway, that file would be decrypted in the printer to be able to be printed, right? So at the end of the day, it will be somewhere in the memory in clear text. So no matter what password a user set up for, for their printer uh, before sending the print job, so you have some printers where you go and swipe your card or enter a pin in order to be able to get the print out. So the people think that by putting that number or having the swipe card uh, basically encrypts everything, which is a false. Actually, it's a, it's a false friend. It, it gives you a false protection. You think you put a pin, everything is secure. It, even though you put a pin, as you'll see, it goes clear text, and even though the administrator of the network increased the traffic over the network, just putting a layer of protection, the, the document is being uh, in plain text. So just uh, a quick... Okay, so we have a, a remote desktop. Just checking the IP. Uh, the, the remote desktop is of, uh, let's say, high official or a high, uh, highly ranked manager. Uh, and he wants to, to print a document. And usually what happens uh, in, in printing, when printing, to, when printing to network printers, is that your printer driver connects to the port 991, usually. It's 99%, it connects to port 9100 of a printer and it sends the data to that printer on that port. So I'll be showing like a simulation what a, a, a printer driver would do in the case of a high rank official. So the printer driver would connect to this port and the uh, official would have a document, right? Uh, created in MS Word, pay, uh, Notepad, whatever the editor is. And uh, when the high rank official, let's say, introduces a, a password or a PIN, it gets, uh, usually gets set as a PGL set hold key like 1337, whatever, right? And, or a password. It can be like for some specific models, it can be user key and the alphanumeric. When it's hold key, it's only numbers. So the, use, uh, the high rank official thinks, okay, I've put password, I have put my PIN, and let's print it. The printer driver will take those pin numbers and so on, will create this PostScript data, data stream. Okay, and the title of the document would be a very secret and encrypted document because we want it to be secret and it's for the high rank officials. And the printer drivers take the stream and sends to the, to the printer. Okay, and it's doing the, the printout. After it's, uh, it's finishing the printout, okay, the printer driver disconnects from the printer, and now we are on the attacker's machine. You don't see any the remote desktop. We are on the attacker machine, and the attacker goes, uh, is the attacker IP, he goes to the, to the same printer, and he connects by tools or manually to the same port 9100 and runs the memory dumper, which I uh, mentioned. Uh, and for a very specific region, basically here is the memory dumper, which uh, it takes like half a year for Xerox to fix, and I cannot 
still cannot release because yeah, the case is still open. Uh, okay, so the attacker did the memory dumping. And you, okay, besides our uh, logs and uh, stuff in the memory, you can see that the attacker got the memory dumping and you see that uh, get title for strings and so on. Basically, you get everything in plain text in memory, right? I mean, doesn't matter the pin, doesn't matter the encryption on your network. In the memory of the printer, it's, anyway, it's clear text. So, I mean, you get the, the, the data, you also get the, the IP, right? You, you know who printed, what printed, what is their uh, usual pin, password, username. Uh, basically, you get a very good profiling of the data. You have uh, the most hardcore data you can get from a printer. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, the idea of the demo. You have everything in, in clear text. Okay, just to move a little bit quicker. Uh, okay, the, the, the other demo which is I want to show is, for example, printer, besides getting the documents or uh, pins or uh, being a fun devices, it can be used uh, to, to scan silently the network because what happens, printers have uh, service discovery protocols, UPnP and so on. So when they connect to networks, they want to know what print servers are there, they want to know what other printers are, because of various configuration stuff or because of various default software installed on the printer. So when it starts uh, and connects to the network, it starts scanning, right? And then it keeps everything in, in its memory. So what an attacker can do, it can have, a f let's say, a full local topology of the network without doing any ping, any scan, any nmap, whatever. I mean, just connect to the printer, get the topology, printer did it for you. No, no need to, to make additional noise on the wire. So again, this, this is uh, the next demo is for getting uh, the printer, do the, the scan for you and basically abuse it. Just one second. Come on. Sorry for this. Okay, so basically, I'm running the memory dumper. It's a little bit painful with the memory dumper because some regions are not mapped and the, the device keeps resetting, so to get a real mem memory map is, it takes some time because the device, when a printer, big printer resets, it takes like five minutes for it to warm up back get back online, check all its trays, check all the, you know, the noises. That's kind of things you get when you hit a, like an unmapped memory. And basically, if you have like 256 megabytes or more, it's like takes, it can take several days just to, to keep resetting and keep mapping the, the memory. It's a bit painful if you don't have the, the configuration. Uh, okay, so. As you can see, for, for, for the memory, uh, we, we have uh, the first is, okay, uh, 0.1, and it's a Linux-based device, UPnP supported, running mini UPnP daemon, uh, okay, and it, it is my actual uh, router, which I used in my network setup, so you get the first thing, I mean, you know already what is the router, what is the, the, the uh, version. So basically, what, what is possible to do is, if you know that this Linux kernel version running this UPnP driver have an exploit, you can take it from C, Turing complete postscript, postscript, printer, pawn, right? And basically, the printer will pawn your device just because it can do an if, the basic if statement. And because it's Turing complete, as I said, everything you can do in C, you can do in PostScript. Okay, in this case with Xerox, it helps because we have access to these special APIs, but in other cases, they have also, uh, in other vendors, they have also special APIs which you can find. So the idea is that 
you can take any exploit, put it in PostScript, and check for exploitable devices from the printer. Yeah, we, we also have another device, which was another uh, printer. It was a an HP. So basically, we have all the details. And in memory, you can see it's all the details. There is the IP. It's the model number. So again, you can start playing, like sending uh, malicious jobs from one printer to another, just hoping through the network, right? I mean, everything is possible. So basically, you. It's the, the ultimate uh, idea could be uh, self-spreading -spread worm on, uh, on the printers, which is some, some work to do, but it's definitely doable, having some, uh, some basic memory dumping stuff and uh, some uh, exercise with the PostScript it helps. So it's a trusted device. It gives all the topology to the, uh, to, to the attacker. And also, we, with the two-way like BSD-like uh, sockets, uh, you can do whatever stuff you want, like connect, do ping, take data from memory, exfiltrate, encrypt. You can implement all kinds of encryption, hashing in PostScript, and exfiltrate the data outside. OK, so basically, that, that's a matrix which we put up to, to, to show that basically there is no privilege level separation. As I said, the admin uh, settings do not separate the privilege on, uh, for the printing uh, port or printing user, printing process. Uh, it doesn't have a secure password setup. Like Everything is in clear text, and it gets uh, HTTP requests. Uh, it leaks the secure basic authentication, gay fail. It leaks the HTTPS SSL keys. No, no, top, no to, uh, topology protection. I mean, as you can see in the demo, no in-memory document protection, which is quite hard to do because uh, anything has to be in some way decrypted. But the problem is that they do not clean up the memory. They just free it, but they do not clean up, which is another problem. Like the, from programming perspective, it's like free the buffer, but it's still in the memory, right? Uh, and yeah, there is no uh, socket restriction on, on, the, on the devices. So all of these, if you sum up, you, you get a very powerful, very weaponized uh, way of owning printers. And basically, from the printers, own other devices. As I, as I mentioned, you can check if the router is exploitable, put exploits. So basically, you have a big PostScript document having like 20 exploits for various things. Just fire it and see what, what you can own in that network. And there's like. A big number of various models uh, which were affected by the super APIs exposed. Uh, they are still fixing because the, apparently the, the impact base is quite high. But yeah, it's half a year since uh, the case is open, and I don't know exactly when, when it will be fixed. OK, so just have a short time. I'll just go very quickly. The nutshell, uh, the attack in a nutshell goes like this. The attacker sends an email or sends a URL to the victim. Uh, the email can contain a non-malicious for computer Word document, but which contains malicious PostScript stream embedded into it, which ends up on the printer. Or uh, the, site, uh, the site sent to the user uh, has uh, the JavaScript or Java versions sending a malicious payload to the printer. Uh, the user opens the attachment and opens the sites, sees the freebie, uh, bites the bait for social engineering attack, is a free coupon, free ticket to Madonna concert, whatever. The imagination is like limitless. Uh, he just prints. The uh, PostScript stream ends up in the MFP, and from there, demos are talking for themselves. So that's in a nutshell. Just one slide uh, covers it all. So yeah, the first stage one and stage two was like the first part of my research from 2010 to 2011. And the stage three is the, the, the current uh, research direction. OK, so uh, the solution, as I mentioned, is because it's a programming language, again, PostScript, you need a dynamic execution environment. And the dynamic execution, uh, which you analyze and see what uh, functionality or what super APIs it uses and so on. 
So basically, uh, I'm working into ha having a sandbox environment where you, you upload a PostScript file through the web interface, for example. It will be published maybe in one month, I hope. Uh, some kind of a beta, where you can upload your files, suspicious files, or the ones you want to test, and it will analyze and tell whether it is suspicious, malicious, or just quite safe to, to send to the printer or to open on GhostScript. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the offensive side is a very interesting uh, idea to integrate some of the, as I mentioned, to take some exploits from Metasploit, put them in PostScript format because it's portable, it's platform independent as well, and uh, have them integrated, uh, basically port them to PostScript, and then, depending on the platform, integrate in various uh, vendors' exploits. Uh, yeah, some solutions, I'll, I'll just go very quick because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, some acknowledgement I want to do uh, is the PostScript work and research was done under the support of security research labs, very cool guys. Uh, and some, uh, some thanks. So, the takeaways uh, for this is that MFPs are like very badly secured in general. They carry a big potential for attack, big attack surface. Uh, they might be upcoming I, I'm not doing FUD or hype, but it's a uh, potential uh, for upcoming attacks in form of PostScript streams, like whether by file or by URL or some internal attacks. Uh, and uh, basically securing MFPs requires better segmentation, better thought on designing the network. It requires uh, better uh, software solutions, which are like ancient old. You can uh, check my upcoming papers uh, and the videos uh, from this talk and from previous research you can see on my YouTube channel if you're interested in the map video or in the uh, Word document video. Uh, you can write to this email and basically that's it. Thank you very much if you have any questions. Ah, Andre, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time, so I don't think we uh, we have time to do any questions. But uh, I'm sure people can okay. reach you. Or uh... okay, so thank you very much, thank Andre. Thank you very much.